opportunity for the invitation uh, to talk here today. Um, and thank you very much for coming along to, to hear uh, what I want to talk to you about. So uh, yes, uh, I've been in Glasgow for about three years now um, and getting, getting my group started up there. Um, and although I'm, I'm based in the School of Chemistry, I have a very sort of um, checkered history. I trained as a synthetic chemist, but I've worked in, in engineering departments, chemistry departments, um, biomedical departments, so sort of hospitals as well. So kind of a broad background. And the reason it's so broad is because all my work has tended to be linked to sensing, at least in, in the first uh, instance. And so what we're interested in doing uh, is building nanomaterials. Uh, in uh, building molecules, so either designing uh, entirely molecular structures or building molecules that we can use to decorate our nanomaterials with and control the, the properties of our nanomaterials. Um, and then trying to stitch these things all together into some sort of sensor system. Um, these days I tend to call it biosensors um, because we have this sort of strong biofocus, but actually I realized having written this talk that everything I've put in here today is is much more on the, on the environmental and, and um, other sensing topics so the bio is now in brackets um, but you'll see some of our, our sort of bio related um, work in a second. Everything we do here involves a, a bit of material science, a bit of organic chemistry, um, we do a fair bit of supramolecular materials assembly and then this all comes together with a bunch of spect spectroscopy and interacting with the end users of our, our hopeful sensor systems um, and a little bit of what I call sort of widgetization, which by which I mean trying to stitch these things into a device that we could give to somebody to, to, to actually use um, themselves. And we have a materials toolbox that we like to dip into and, and try and you know, use to um, uh, kind of create our systems and, and, and engineer what, what, what we're trying to do. So we build fluorophores. So we've got a nice bodipi up here. Um, we, so we build kind of static fluorophores, responsive fluorophores. We build a whole bunch of crosslinkers and surfactants to try and attach things to our nanoparticles or attach nanoparticles to each other or attach molecules to each other. These tend to be white solids or colorless liquids, so they don't photograph so well for these kind of slides. Um, but then more, more photogenically, we have our noble metal nanoparticles. So we build a whole bunch of different gold shapes, for example. We build these gold clusters. Um, so these are kind of two-ish nanometer gold clusters, which have this beautiful long sort of uh, luminescence um, in, in the red and into the near infrared. We build quantum nanostructures, so classical quantum dots, but we've started working with quantum platelets recently as well. And you can see the TEM here where they all stack up really nicely sideways and have these wonderful optical properties. Um, this sample has a full width half maximum of eight nanometers from a colloidal system, um, which I think is just uh, phenomenal. Um, and then we've recently tried to move a little bit away from cadmium because everything here is cadmium apart from the gold. Um, and so, um, uh, from from work on, on a fellowship I was on in, in Canada and then carrying on now uh, with Pete Scabara in the School of Chemistry in, in Glasgow, we started investigating some polymer nanoparticles as well, which also luminesce nicely and how we can tailor their properties. And what we're trying to do here is, is kind of get these materials to interact with interesting and complex samples. And, and by that, I mean, respond in some way to do some sensing. And we have two approaches to sensing in my group. Um, the first is very classical. Uh, it's what I call specific sensing. And by this, I mean, we have a receptor for a particular analyte and we can get maybe a yes or no answer about the presence of that analyte. And if we tune our sensor carefully and if we measure things properly, we can maybe get some sort of quantitation out as well. We use antibodies, we use aptamers, we use enzymes, you know, all these kind of very classical and well-studied uh, kind of systems. But there are a few issues with these kind of approaches. Uh, the first of which is cross-reactivity. Most of these sort of uh, sensors are not idealistic systems. They don't just respond to one thing. Uh, and so that means we actually do see a bit of cross-reactivity in our systems and you can embrace this. And so the second approach uh, that I take in a lot of my sensing work and what I'm going to talk to you today about is about cross-reactive sensing. And this is where we build a sensor array, uh, so a set of different sensing elements. And when we expose an analyte or a, a complex sample to our sensing elements, 
we generate a response from each of these individual sensors and we can collect these together and use them as a fingerprint for our sample. We can analyze these fingerprints statistically um, and, and generate some patterns that we can then kind of visually look at and, and gain information from or analyze with mathematical tools. The, the kind of uh, benefits of this approach are that we can uh, look for things um, which are, you know, we don't necessarily know are there. So in this first instance here, we have a, um, an analyte here, which we don't know is there, it's in our sample, but we haven't built a sensor for it. This analyte might give us a huge amount of information about our sample. It might be the next key biomarker for, for cancer, let's say. But if we're not looking for it, we can't find it. When we use these sensor arrays, we can screen everything in our in our mixture basically if we can build a sensor array that will interact with this then we might get some sort of signal out for it and we can kind of look backwards and take an, an almost omics like approach and disentangle the, the data and then try and find these uh these unknown unknowns the things that we we don't know are there and we don't know we're looking for but might be really really useful the other benefit of this system is that we can look at everything at once so we can look at a complex mixture and fingerprint that mixture. And then if that mixture changes, so let's say we're looking at someone's blood uh, and they have a disease and that causes some change in their blood makeup, um, we can look for those changes quite subtly and quite uh, distinctly. And, and that allows us to, to rapidly screen samples and, and get information about uh, a patient, for example. And I just want to take an aside here on, on training and testing. So how we actually build our statistical models, because in this talk, you will see a whole bunch of these kind of graphs with these sort of colored blobs on. Um, and I just wanted to explain a little bit for those not familiar with these systems as to you know, what, what they are and what they mean and how we come about them. So the first thing we do when we have a sensing array uh, is we will train a model. So we'll take the sensing array and we'll expose it to a set of samples that we know what they are. So in this case, we've taken the sensor away and we've exposed it to two samples, a blue, blue sample down here and a red sample up here. And we can say to the, the program the model to try and differentiate these two sets of data as best as it can. So each of these X's is uh, a data set from the sensing array. And what's happened is the mathematical model has sort of flattened this data, if you will. It's, it's compressed it down to, to a 2D data point from a, a multivariate or a, a multidimensional um, sensing uh, kind of input um, and to enable us to, to see better how these, these two different groups can be differentiated. So these canonical scores uh, along, along these axes are just linear combinations of the sensor outputs um, and so represented in, in 2D space. Once we've trained this model, we can then um, measure some unknown samples. So here's, here's two unknown samples that we've, we've measured and we can process them with the same canonical score model that we've, we've created. And we can look at how do these unknown data points sit relative to the rest of the data. And as you can see here, this point sits much closer to the blue data than it does to the red data. So it's, it's highly probable that this this data point corresponds to a, a blue sample. Um, and we can add some sort of statistical uh, sort of meaningfulness to that, a probability to that. And if we look at the second example up here, it sits much closer to the red data than it does to the blue data. So it's, it's likely uh, that it's the red data. What we can then do is either measure these samples using some other technique, or if, they're, if we're blinded to them, we can unblind ourselves and see, did we get this right? You know, how accurate was our, our measurement approach? How accurate is our model? Um, and so we do this with, with all our data. We can either do what's called a leave one out process where we measure all our data, we cut out a portion of our data, and then we, we run this process and then use that cut out portion to test it. And we can iterate that process many, many times uh, and see how accurate our, our data is. Or we can literally have two sample sets where one sample set the, the operator is blind to and we don't unblind ourselves to the very end. Um, and, and, uh, and then we can compare at the end and just see what the accuracy is on that, that separate blinded uh, testing set. So we think these are a pretty versatile tool. 
Um, and uh, in my group, we are building molecular sensing arrays to try and detect uh, early stage liver fibrosis, for example. So we're working with clinicians in London and Edinburgh to engineer polymer and molecular systems um, with molecular fluorophores in to try and uh, fingerprint patients' blood samples. We are building arrays to try and sense bacteria, uh, both in patient samples and in environmental samples. And this is this works inspired by bacterial siderophore chemistry because there's this challenge of sort of detecting very, very low concentrations of bacteria in a sample. Um, and even if we can detect them, we want to know what strain they are. So we, we want to be able to detect and type our bacteria at the same time to maybe get some, some information around what sort of antibiotics we might use, for example. We're controlling our and exploring our nano toolbox a little more. Um, so we're trying to control the interfacial chemistry around our nanoparticles, as I hinted at before, in order to kind of tailor these sensing interactions um, and, and to build up these, these arrays uh, of sort of nano sensors. And kind of looking beyond uh, biomedicine, um, we're kind of looking at new challenges in and new markets for our sensing arrays. And, and these kind of come into consumer goods, fraud, quality assurance, and this kind of thing. And with a particular kind of interest in whiskey testing, because when in Scotland, that's, that's what one does. And uh, so today I'm actually going to focus on these two stories uh, a little bit and, and tell you what we've been doing. I felt these had slightly more of a materials focus um, rather than the, the very sort of organic chemistry, which is going on on, on the liver project. And I'm going to start off with some quantum dots. So as I hinted before, my group makes a lot of, of colloidal quantum dots. Um, and uh, I apologize if I'm, I'm teaching people to suck eggs here, um, but I thought I'd give a quick overview of, sort of what a quantum dot is. Um, so these are less than 10 nanometer colloidal semiconductor nanoparticles, and they are highly fluorescent. Um, they have very, very narrow emission colors. Um, and we can tune the color by changing the size of the nanoparticle. So the smaller we make the nanoparticle, we increase the quantum confinement uh, of the exciton in our semiconductor, uh, and we widen the band gap, uh, and that gives us a bluer emission when we photo excite them. We can change the materials. So these are cadmium selenide, but just hidden in the middle here is an indium phosphide sample. Um, so we can, we can use different materials to make these and, and tune the color through choosing the material. We tend to typically shell these materials as well. So we overgrow an epitaxial layer of a, an inert material on the outside. Um, if we use something like zinc sulfide, it, it just kind of protects the, the nanoparticle and, and maybe enhances the luminescence quantum yield a little. Um, but we can also uh, grow uh, shells which are offset band gaps to the, to the core material. Uh, and by doing that, we can change the, the band gap size and, and tune the color of emission. And so this sample up, up here is one where we've grown a doped shell on that, which is uh, one of these type two systems. And so we've shifted the emission right through into the, into the near infrared. And all of these are excited by one color. And this is why they're so attractive because we use one kind of blue UV uh, source here and we can, we can light up all these different color particles at once. They're really photostable. So we can leave these under the UV lamp all day long and they don't really bleach unlike an organic dye, which would just dissolve away to nothing. Um, and they have a surface. And this is the really important bit for us because we can derivatize this surface with our ligand chemistries. So we make dots, we can make rods, we can make platelets, and we can try and put different things uh, on the surface using different ligand chemistries that we develop in house um, and, and uh, sort of add some sort of sense of material to help our quantum dot interact with the world around it. And so the first project I want to talk to you about is, is actually the sensing of explosives uh, with the quantum dot array. And um, when I started on this work, it was reasonably well known that you could quench a quantum dot using an explosive. So you could bring something like TNT close to the surface of a, a colloidal quantum dot and it would dim. You would see a, a loss in emission. And this is because there's a, a photo induced electron transfer um, from the sort of electron rich excited state of your quantum dot to your very electron deficient electron accepting uh, nitro explosive. And um, we were interested in exploring these for um, partly for sort of homeland security applications, um, but also for an environmental application, which is range monitoring when the uh, MOD 
go out and test all the new toys on Salisbury Plain or, or sort of similar places, then there's a pollution issue that the materials from the explosives get into the groundwater, get into the soils. Um, and these materials over here are nasty. They're carcinogenic. They're really quite toxic. Um, so around um, munitions ranges, around munitions factories as well, which is an issue up near where I live in, in Scotland, um, there's a potential pollution hazard. And so to have a quick and easy test for the presence of these materials at low concentration is really important. But more than that, we want to know what material is present. You know, it's all very well going there's an explosive here, but actually what, which tank has leaked? Was it the, was it the DNT tank? Was it the TNT tank? You know, which, which munitions are contaminating? Was it the ones with RDX in it? So we, we wanted to be able to not only detect explosives, but also determine uh, which explosives were present. And so to do that, we built an array. Uh, so we had um, a set of different quantum dots. They had a set of different functional surfaces on them that tried to, to bring these materials closer or, or keep them away uh, and to get a variable quenching response. And that's our fingerprint, our fluorescent fingerprint for each of these different explosives. So I promised you a little bit of organic chemistry. Uh, so here it is, uh, the last bit, I promise. Um, we tried to build different surfaces to attract uh, the different explosives selectively. So we used um, materials that we thought would pi stack. Um, so you kind of form these elastoplast type complexes with uh, things like uh, DNT and TNT, these nitro aromatic compounds. The nitro aliphatics are a little harder. They don't interact so well. Um, and so we thought we could use uh, these cavitans that have a really hydrophobic uh, inside face that they might uh, sort of uh, get the explosive to go inside and hold that close to the quantum dot surface. So we, we played around with beta cyclodextrin. Um, I actually came up to Cambridge and did a little bit of work with Lauren Sherman and, and we, we were trying to build this monofunctional uh, cucubitural. That was, uh, was really sort of instructive six months of my life trying to work with this molecule. Um, and, um, and then we also had this calixer in here, which, which actually did dual duty because it has the hydrophobic inside, but it's also aromatic. So it, it could potentially interact with kind of all of our explosives to some degree. And we wanted to put these on the surface of the quantum dot. So we built a kind of common derivatized molecule. And that's really where my group kind of come into their own as we, we build these molecules where we have a sort of common end group uh, here, uh, the perk acid, so a dithyl that will stick nicely to our, our quantum dot surface. And then some sort of uh, generic thing that we can attach all this stuff with. So here an azide um, and all of these you can see are functionalized with alkynes and we can do a click chemical reaction, a copper catalyzed reaction that allows us to stick these things together um, kind of on will. And so we had uh, we had molecules that had the clicks on the end, the cyclodextrin on the end. And we also looked at some molecules that had sort of generic end groups. Um, so things that had an OH on, things that had a, just a long chain peg with a methoxy on that were sort of almost like blank surfaces um, to, to explore the interaction of those as well. And at the end of all this, sort of doing all this chemistry, picking out what worked and what didn't work, we had seven different combinations of ligands and quantum dots across three different colors. And we screened a bunch of these to see what, what would detect explosives and what just didn't respond at all to explosives. And uh, at the end of it all, we ended up with three different quantum dots that were particularly kind of responsive, which were a blue quantum dot with an OH group on the surface, the green with the calixarane uh, group on the surface, and the red actually with the OME on, on the surface. And we screened these as uh, in what I call single channel mode. So you had one quantum dot in the, in the, in the vial, you add one portion of one explosive and you measure that and you do this many, many, many times for all your different possible combinations to try and sort of isolate what, what's doing what. We got limits of detection uh, in the parts per billion range, which was you know, very promising. But when we took our, our three best responses and we sort of combined them into this array, so we took the data from those three and we, we tried to use our, our little statistical model here to, to see can it actually determine which explosive is which from the quenching patterns. We found it, it worked great for the nitro aromatics, but for the nitro aliphatics over here, the RDX and the PETN, it was rubbish. Um, so we only got 80% accuracy because it just confused these all the time. It couldn't tell the difference. But the whole idea here was to actually move into a multiplex tool. And you can see uh, here that we have three different quantum dot colors. Um, 
And when we uh, just mix them together uh, volumetrically, we can see the dotted gray line there underneath is the, the spectrum that uh, we get. And the black line is just the mathematical linear combination of the three and they overlay perfectly. So we, we can really actually distinguish these three materials in one vial. So it's a multiplex sensor with three different quantum dots all put into one solution. And when we add the explosives to this, um, here's some example sort of quenching curves that we get as you increase the concentration of explosive, the, the different uh, features quench at slightly different rates. Um, and if we uh, try and do our, our mathematical modeling on this, um, we can now see that the RDX and the PETN are actually well separated. So this is really promising. Um, we've now got 100% sort of accuracy We've maybe sacrificed a little bit of sensitivity in this system, but more interestingly was this question, why did this work? Um, and what we think is going on here is that by actually having all three quantum dots in one pot, when the explosive is exposed to them, it can choose slightly better which quantum dot it's going to interact with. There's a, there's a surface segregation effect, um, we think, whereby the explosive can kind of look at the three different interfaces it's, it's faced with and go, actually, this one is a better fit for me. I'm going to quench this quantum dot uh, maybe slightly more. So this was quite uh, sort of encouraging and we ended up talking to DSTL, um, the UK's Defence Science Laboratories, about how we could start to kind of bring this, this technology to fruition. But one concern that they had was about the toxic nature of using cadmium. You know, the explosives are toxic enough, we don't necessarily want to be putting cadmium selenide out into the environment too. And so we thought about less toxic materials that we could use. Um, and at this point, a PhD student joined the group um, who had previous experience working with MOFs. And so what, uh, what we set about doing was trying to build luminescent MOF frameworks um, as our, our luminescent sensor. And so what you can do with a MOF is you can, uh, you know, you can use the organic struts or the metal to give you fluorescence. So we can, we can build a luminescent organic linker um, with carboxylic acids on each end to hold the metal uh, corner pieces, or we could actually use a luminescent metal like a, a lanthanide, for example, um, as our, our source of luminescence in the moth. Um, and I've called them here, I've called them pre-functionalized particles because these are not particles we're decorating the surface of, we're actually using the inherent properties of the metal organic framework to kind of give us our, our sensing interaction and, and hopefully our differentiation between different materials because we can tune, and I, I say tune loosely, we can we can try and tune pore size. Um, so we, we can try and tune different link, choose different linkers, sorry, which will give us uh, different pore sizes in, in the MOF. So different things we able to go in and out. We can choose the sort of polarity of those. Um, we can change the metal and maybe even the shape of, of the pores and things like that. Um, and all the time they show luminescence. And when we, we built some luminescent moths and we uh, exposed them to vapors or solution phase of different nitro materials, they quenched. And that was, that was really promising that we could actually detect, um, even in the vapor phase, we could detect sort of molecules like this, um, sorry, like this uh, dinitro compound down here. This compound isn't an explosive, but what it is is the molecule that they use to tag commercial plastic explosives. Uh, it's called DMDMB, and it's actually what goes into the explosives they'd sell to mining companies, for example, to help dogs recover those should they ever go missing, um, should a shipment get lost uh, somewhere that it shouldn't have done. So we can detect these kind of tag labels. Um, we could detect these these uh, some higher vapor phase uh, uh, explosives in the um, in, uh, in the early stages, but this was all just single molecule, single response. So could we build an array uh, and could we differentiate between the explosives in the same way as we did with the quantum dots? So we, um, we set about building this array and so Monica built um, this MOF here herself. So this was a new MOF. Um, which had a very, very large pore size that had this sort of 16 by 16 angstrom pore size. Um, and then we, we also searched the literature to see what else other people had done in this field. And uh, we found these two materials, um, which were, this one was reported as being quite sensitive to nitroaromatic explosives in the first instance, it had a much smaller pore size, but a similar sort of structure. So a zinc uh, metal with, a, with an organic luminescent linker. 
And uh, the third one, uh, as you can see, he has a European metal uh, sort of uh, unit, and that is the, the luminescence. So it's, it's got, it emits in the red um, from the European metal with these very sharp uh, European emissions. And again, this had a, a reasonably small uh, sort of regular pore size. And we started exposing these to the different explosives in solution this time, and we got quenching, which was great, exactly as we expected to see. And this graph is, is here to illustrate a couple of different points. The first is that, you know, if we just have one MOF, so this is the, the, the MOF that Monica built herself um, and designed herself, you know, it responds to, to Tetril, as you can see here in purple, pretty quickly compared to the other explosives. And at 20 micromolar, you quench about 20% of the, the initial fluorescence. If we go across here and we look at the, the PETN results, um, you can see that this explosive, you have to get to like 33, 34 micromolar to get that 20% quenching. So if we just use one MOF and we just add explosive and we don't know what it is and we see 20% quenching, we still don't know what it is. We know we've got some explosive, but we, you know, we need to, to sort of combine the different MOF signatures to, to actually be able to determine uh, what explosive we have. And the second point here is this is the baseline, this, this black line here. So this is just blank solvent being added. And this caused us all sorts of interesting headaches because what you're seeing here is it's a dilution effect, but it's, it's much stronger than just a dilution effect. It's also some sort of a sort of settling effect with these MOF particles. They're not nice colloidally stable particles like uh, the quantum dots are. They're quite big, they're on the micron scale, they're not really nanoparticles at all, they're just nanoporous. Um, and so uh, Monica had to, to really work hard to come up with a new protocol that would actually enable us to, to separate out this baseline from a real response. Um, and, and she did that and it involved sort of various vortexing and shaking stages between each measurement to keep everything nicely uh, suspended and looking at different solvents to try and sort of match the, the best solvent system with our with our MOFs. Um, but at the end of it all, uh, we could correct all this data and we could we could manage this baseline. And then when we attempted our three MOF array and collected all that data, we could see that we got nice fingerprints that separated all of our materials. So this is the, the, um, the score plot again, uh, as before. This is a, what we call a confusion matrix, whereby numbers on the diagonal are good, numbers off the diagonal are bad. That shows that the, the, you know, here the DNT is being mistaken for TNT. And there's a little similarity between DNT and TNT. They sit close in space. That's not unexpected because they are chemically very, very similar. Um, what was quite exciting here is we could determine PETN very well that hadn't really been done before um, and this was due to our large pore MOF so this uh, this AM1 that has this this really large pore size that could maybe actually get a PTN molecule inside it uh, whereas the other smaller MOFs may not be able to. Um, and the other thing that we did here that was quite uh, sort of different was we screened a range of concentrations all too often you look at these kind of uh, works in the literature and they take one concentration and they, they just do it the same for everything and they say we can differentiate and we've been guilty of this ourselves in the past and what we were thinking about here was well you know we don't know what concentration we're actually looking for so how do these fingerprints these these uh, you know deterministic and differentiating sort of scores we give them hold up if we change the concentration of them off so we collected data over a, a, a you know, much larger range of concentrations than people had looked at before. Um, and you can see that as we start to introduce these lower concentrations in there, things start to kind of drag together a little bit and we, we sort of head towards the middle of the graph, which is, you know, again, not unexpected, very small amounts of stuff and maybe slightly harder to differentiate, as you can look down here, than very large amounts of stuff where there's big signals. But even sort of going down to so this 20 micromolar, and we actually went all the way down to six micromolar, um, we could still get above 70% accuracy. And what really did happen was the DNT and the TNT started to collide. So you can see here that you know, this number has, has gone up um, between the two. Um, and that's showing that these, these are starting to overlay and our model isn't necessarily so readily able to, to differentiate between uh, the samples that we're looking at. But it was still a promising result. And the other thing that we wanted to investigate here was actually one of mechanism. And this is quite interesting for these MOF sensors 
because there's kind of various schools of thought out there. Um, the first one which we got hit with was, well, your moths are just degrading. Uh, just these these sort of things that you're dosing in, and they're just causing the moth to fall apart, and that's why your fluorescence is, is changing or going away. Um, so we did some XRD in situ with, um, you know, exposing the moth to, um, to different explosives in, in uh, sort of uh, different concentrations. And actually, we didn't see a huge amount of change in our XRD patterns. Um, we don't see any great big sort of amorphized baseline or anything like that coming out of there. So we think that these aren't falling apart. They're staying, you know, pretty intact. Um, and the other school of thought is one of um, a sort of screening mechanism, an optical screening, whereby these colored curves down here are the absorption spectra for the different explosives. And this black uh, broadband emission is the emission from one of the MOFs. And you can see here, there's a, there's a nice overlap between them. So possibly these uh, explosives are uh, you know, screening the, the emission from the MOF or um, you know, somehow sort of interfering with that emission. Some people call it um, in inverse fret, but it's not it's not really inverse fret. But um, you know, they, that's a, a term which is thrown around this kind of uh, optical screening effect. But PETN in, in green, which is actually one of our more successful um, sort of quenching explosives, that does not screen because that has no absorption at all above 300 nanometers so that clearly is not a screening effect either um so there's still a sort of open question on that but what we think is happening is we are getting an electron transfer like we saw with the quantum dot uh you know the explosive is either sticking to the surface of the particle um or it's actually penetrating into the pores of the particle given we see differentiation we we like to think that we, have, we are getting some sort of pore based um uh, sort of different different effects um, and and causing the quenching from within the moth exactly as we we claim it is um, so hopefully that is what's going on but there's a little bit of photophysics that we need to do here I think to maybe explore this a little more deeply but you know there's some modeling we've got which looks really promising um, and as we sort of add the evidence together it looks it looks quite promising from from the point of view of actually being able to sort of sieve these explosives using different pore sizes on our materials And then uh, the last little vignette that I want to talk about today is sort of a slight shift in, in direction. It was a move away from explosives. Um, DSTL were quite happy with what we'd done, but you know they they sort of wanted to go in and think about things, I guess. Um, so the the other thing um, that is a you know a great non toxic sensor is a gold nanoparticle. Um, and so you can see at the top here some, some beautiful red colloidal gold nanoparticle solutions. And when we add some sort of sensor triggering response to them here, they tend to and they go blue. And this is great. It makes a really obvious uh, plasmonic sensor. It's well known, it's well studied. It's very hard to multiplex. You know, these, these things, they go red, they go blue. There's not a lot we can do about that. So what we wanted to do was come up with a, you know, a, a way of investigating um, multiplexed plasmonic sensing. Um, and so to do that, um, I was lucky enough to be able to work with Alistair Clark at the University of Glasgow. Um, and he is able to, to build gold nanoparticles on a surface. So these little um, lithography produced um, gold elements on a flat surface. And these are, you know, they absorb light exactly as, as a gold nanoparticle would. They have an LSPR, a, lot, a, a local surface plasma resonance. Uh, and so when you put shine light through them, you see this, this transmission dip where they're, where they're absorbing. If you can change the local refractive index around these materials, what you see is a shift uh, in this LSPR. Um, and so if we can bring our analytes sort of selectively to the surface of these materials, we can detect this shift and we can use that as our sensor response, as our transduction response. So this moves away from luminescence and by using surfaces, perhaps these are more easily controlled and more easily manipulated than colloidal particles because we can in theory make the same thing every time uh, using an e-beam tool rather than you know the slight batch to batch variations that we might see uh, doing a colloidal synthesis. But there is a question here, which is, you know, 
as with everything you can tell, I'm heading towards here building a, a sensing array. So how do we build a multiplexed sensing array from this effect? So Alistair and, and Justin, uh, who was a PhD student in his group, um, built these amazing surfaces, which combined two metals. So uh, the first was a gold uh, cube, just as I, as I showed on the slide before, and it has this very distinctive uh, absorption at sort of six, uh, sort of about 660 nanometers. Now, aluminium has an LSPR in a very different region of the spectrum over here in, in the green at 500. And so actually, if you build a surface, so this is just the aluminium cubes on the surface, this is just the gold cubes on the surface. If you build a multi-metal surface where uh, we have gold um, in the, in the uh, even rows and aluminium in the, in the odd rows, um, so this checkerboard pattern, actually, when you measure the transmission of this, you see both peaks and they, they operate independently of each other. So this is great. We now have two different sensor elements on one surface on one little uh, chip, and um, that enables us to, to start to multiplex things up. Because even more than that, we can do selective chemical modification. So the chemistry for modifying the gold and the chemistry for modifying the aluminium are very, very different. So we can use thiols to, to add something to the gold, and then we can treat with a silane um, and that will modify the aluminium and the, the aluminium, the very thin aluminium oxide coating layer. Um, and so we can add two chemistries to these, um, uh, these sort of multi-metal sensors in one pot. Um, and so what Justin did was build a set of these, which each had these sort of different pairs of chemistry on. Um, and so there we had our, our multiplexed array. And uh, so we did some modeling um, and as expected, there's a nice plasmonic response from the sharp tips of the, the corners of these structures um, because they are sort of slightly cubic. Um, and we get a nice field enhancement. And we need to keep them well spaced because if they get too close together, then you do start to kind of smudge out your nice individual peaks. Um, but also we can modify them and we could tell we modified them because as you add this surface capping layer, you are changing the local refractive index already. Um, and so that will cause a shift uh, in, the, in the transmission peak. Um, so you can see here that these peaks kind of shift a little bit depending on what are the different chemistries we put on. So each of these different colors is, is one of the different chemistries. Um, and in the single plex mode, uh, sort of the monometallic sensors up here, these are, one chip is gold, one chip is aluminum. So these, these peaks are from separate chips. Um, and they, they behave in a certain way. In the bimetallic sensor, this is where the gold and the aluminium are inter interleafed in this checkerboard pattern. Um, we do the same process, but in the one pot. And the, the changes we see are very, very similar to what we see in the monometallic in terms of the, the, the sort of nanometers shift, which is what we're interested in here. Um, and so that's promising. That suggests these things are really operating quite independently um, and able to sense things independently, which is exactly what we want in our multiplex sensor. Justin then wanted to use these to taste whiskey. So uh, what he did was expose these um, monometallic sensors or these bimetallic sensors to a whole bunch of different whiskies, and we studied how well did this did these sort of uh, sensors taste the whiskey um, and did uh, monometallic or multi-metallic um, you know, work better. So here's the results. So we have uh, the water is actually off, off to the left here. I've not shown it on these uh, zoomed in graphs, um, but we had some ethanol, just 40% ethanol and water, some vodka, effectively just 40% ethanol and water, and then a whole bunch of seven different whiskies. Uh, so the one to three were from the same distillery, but different ages. Uh, four to six were from the same distillery, but different casks. Um, so a sherry cask, a bourbon cask, and a rum cask. And then the seventh one was a bit of a wild card. That was a peated whiskey, a heavily peated whiskey, um, as, a, as something slightly different. And, you know, the results were kind of interesting. You can, there, there are some things you can read into these plots. There are some things you can't. So for example, uh, particularly on the multiplex, the water and the vodka sit quite close together. That's exactly what we want to see. That's exactly as we'd expect. That's telling us that, you know, the changes we see for the other samples are coming from their, their, the fact they are whiskey. Um, so we can uh, use those as a, you know, this, this tongue is picking up on compounds in the whiskey. It's not just measuring the strength of the alcohol. Um, and then we sort of wondered if we could actually pick up on the, 
you know, on the, the origins of the whiskey a little bit as well. You know, does, does a longer time in cask correlate to you know, a, a particular position on this plot? Not so much. Um, but there is some interesting work that we can do around that, which I'll touch on later. But one of the key things was, was singleplex or multiplex better? Um, and the, the answer was not really. So here we don't necessarily think we're getting any different surface segregation, depending on whether we've got everything in one pot or everything in the other pot, but they are different. So maybe there are some slightly different chemical processes going on. But one thing that was key from the multiplex was it just made measuring everything quicker. You know, it's just one one chip rather than a whole bunch of chips. Um, and so you can actually get your readings much, much faster because you have, you know, both both your peaks measured in a single in a single shot. Um, and so this is, you know, this has really opened the door for a few different projects. So here's some more whiskies on the same chips being tasted and, and again, looking at sort of different verticals, different ages, um, different um, sort, of, sort of rare whiskies versus modern day whiskies. Um, and I've added a third axis here just so you can see that you can, you know, you can look at these data in 2D as you do here. Sometimes you see these things overlapping and actually they're not overlapping because you can add, you know, as many sensors as you add, you add more dimensions to your data. Uh, and so you can start to look at these things in higher dimensional space and, and sort of tease apart smaller changes. Um, and this led us thinking about fraud, you know, can we use this sort of sensor to, to taste an old whiskey? keep it on a database if a bottle of that then came up for auction could we uh test that with the sun with our little sort of uh, plasmonic tongue we've got here if that uh overlaps with the the response that we had before fantastic it's probably genuine if it looks really really different well maybe either it's gone off or maybe it's a fraud um so hopefully i've shown you you know, sensing arrays are a pretty versatile tool um, and we yeah we're sort of now expanding out this into into the biomedical world as well as, as sort of the environmental and and quality assurance world um and with that i would like to thank my group um here we are in a socially distanced christmas meetup um outside uh, no more than a meter and a half apart. Um, so these guys uh, build a lot of the nanoparticles and a lot of the molecules uh, that I've shown you today. Uh, and I'd also like to thank my collaborators across a lot of these projects, particularly uh, Dr. Alistair Clark on the plasmonic work, uh, Dr. Monica Yurchich, who built all the MOFs, Professor David Scanlon at UCL, who did a lot of the modeling for the MOFs for us, and Justin Sperling, who, who was helping on the plasmonic work as well. Um, all these guys for paying for all of this. Um, and just to leave you with a, a sort of summary, which you know, I think these nano toolboxes are really powerful. Um, we can widgetize them and we're starting to move towards this sort of how do we make this into a, a gizmo that we can hand to a, a clinician in, in a clinic. Um, and to do this, we can derivatize our nanomaterials in all sorts of different clever ways. And, and that's what we're really interested in doing. Um, all we have to do is, is pick our material, pick our surface and try and tune it to the, uh, the response we want. So with that, thank you very much indeed for your attention and I'll happily take any questions.